this program is a result of, of lots of years of working with uh, students, first students, and then uh, older students, uh, older adults uh, in, in the tropics. I've taken people, uh, began with students taking them to uh, Costa Rica, uh, Panama, Brazil. Uh, then uh, uh, since that time, we've also traveled to other parts of the tropics. I was uh, an invited visiting scholar in Taiwan, which is also in the sort of subtropics and the, uh, uh, the other side of the world. Uh, we've done a lot in, um, uh, my wife and I have traveled to Australia, uh, and we've since been taking people, most recently in November we were in Brazil. Uh, we were in Ecuador and the Galapagos uh, last year, and uh, I've taken people to uh, Chile, uh, uh, down all the way down, not in the tropics, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, uh, in, the, uh, in the southern part of South America. So we're uh, uh, very, very fortunate to have been able to, uh, to travel to all these places and we continue to travel. I'm taking another group back to the Galapagos in, um, in April. And then in October, we're going back to Costa Rica for a different trip as well. I have two more Costa Rica trips coming up, different ones than we've done before. And uh, uh, a lot of people say, well, why the tropics? Why the tropics? And, and this program is a result of that, because the tropics are really um, these incredible places for biodiversity. We go and see all these birds and these different plants. And in fact, uh, I was looking at my sunroom this morning where we have, we have Cindy and I often have breakfast or, and lunch out there. And I looked around at all the plants and I realized those begonias, those philodendrons, uh, the anthuriums, all those plants, they're all tropical plants. Most of the plants, our house plants, come from the tropics. And in fact, when we go to these areas, we see them uh, in the jungles. And we, I point them out, oh, there's a split-leaf philodendron climbing that tree. It's a lot bigger than the ones we usually have in our homes, but that's where it came from originally. Uh, so it's, it's a place of incredible biodiversity and really it, the, the, the place around the earth from, from which an awful lot of things evolved. It's a very complex ecosystem with lots and lots of, um, of, of very complex food webs. And uh, we'll take a little uh, look at, at a few of the things here today as we go through the program. That's my contact information. We'll come back to that later. So, so why do we, we travel today? We travel for, for lots of reasons here. Um, we, we travel to, to, uh, uh, to see places that are new to us. We love to go to places. I think many of us like to, we love home. My wife and I, we love to travel. We love to come home. But we like to see new places, like to see new kinds of things. Uh, 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 we want to see things before they disappear. Uh, uh, and increasingly, as global warming uh, takes hold across the earth, the tropics and the, the, the uh, cold zones around the Arctic and the Antarctic are the two places that are changing the fastest. They see, have seen changes long before we in the temperate zone around the earth, where the majority of people are, uh, those, uh, the changes were taking place are much, much more quickly. And as a result, I think a lot of times when we read the news, we say, well, gee, I better get there now <laughs> because it may not exist in, in, even in our lifetime. Some of these things may disappear. We certainly want to uh, uh, experience new things, see new people, uh, understand other cultures. I always told my students when I, when I took them uh, is that if you, if you go with us to these uh, foreign lands, if you go with an open mind and an open palate, you're willing to taste some new things, you'll never think the same way again. And I think that's really true, uh, that, that travel to other places and you see that, my golly, there are lots of right ways to live a life. <laughs> there aren't right and wrong ways, there are lots of right ways. They're just different than ours. And uh, it really helps, I think, open people up. I was very fortunate when I was in high school to be able to be an exchange student to Brazil. And, um, uh, I, I, I traveled there and, and lived with a family, in fact, a family that we're still in contact with. We still, uh, we go to weddings uh, in my, of my, uh, my nieces and nephews uh, in Brazil because we're still close to the family. And those relationships have been maintained for many, many, over 40, 
Oh my golly, it's been uh, half a century now, hasn't it, Mary? Mary went uh, to kindergarten, and uh, she and I were in kindergarten and all through high school together in the same classes. So uh, we've known each other a long time, uh, so through, through thin and thick, uh, as it were. <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we, we go to these places to experience new things, to uh, experience new cultures, and if you go with an open mind, by golly, it really helps you understand the world in a totally different way uh, than if we just uh, stayed here. Um, uh, oftentimes we go to offer our help and, and service. Uh, lots of people, perhaps some of you, have gone with the neighbor to neighbor program, the, uh, uh, the, the exchanges with other cities and towns. Uh, lots of programs uh, uh, allow you to go and, and offer service projects. Some of you may have gone with churches to, on, on various missions. Certainly, it enriches our lives. It makes our lives so rich. I, I can't tell you uh, how much our travels have enriched our lives. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I hope it's obvious, but, but it really has, has given us such... We have family now, literally all over the world. Uh, there are extended family. Uh, we were the host family for um, uh, uh, an exchange student from, uh, from Australia. They uh, subsequently came, his parents, his biological parents, came and lived with us about five summers before they died. So we became very, very close to their whole family, and all, many of his other family members have come and stayed with us as well. So we have family all over the world. The guy who has driven for me in Costa Rica, who's as the, the bus, Franklin, he's like a brother to me. Uh, we, we exchange uh, uh, notes in Spanish all the time. He is... Um, he had two years of education, his second and third grade, and uh, um, was working in the, uh, uh, in the fields with his father beginning when he was five years old. He didn't have his first pair of shoes until he was 16. <laughs> you know? So uh, it, it, he's very much a part of our lives. Uh, uh, his, his writing in Spanish is not always um, uh, literate. In fact, sometimes I have to say it out loud because he spells phonetically and, and Spanish is a pretty phonetic language but, but I have to sometimes say it out loud to understand what he's meaning because his spelling is not very good. But that doesn't matter. He's still my brother and, and uh, 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 sort of mi hermoso. Uh, so he's, he's, uh, he's, he's very much uh, hermano rather, excuse me. Uh, he is very much my, my brother and, and uh, uh, even though he's not biologically so. So those those, those relationships with other people and other places around the world, I think, really enrich our lives. So we've been to, I wonder if I can, can I turn one of these off, is that okay? Yeah. Which one? Ah, perfect, perfect, that's better. Um, so we've been to lots and lots of places. Um, on the left here is a uh, uh, picture of the Organization for Tropical Studies, uh, bridge uh, going over a river in, in, uh, in Costa Rica. Uh, it is a uh, uh, organization for tropical studies. This is La Selva Biological Station. Uh, is an amazing place. It, it has put out more uh, papers on tropical biology and tropical ecology than any other single uh, station in the world. There are all sorts of fabulous studies that have come out of La Selva. Uh, so we've taken lots of students there and lots of other folks there uh, uh, as well. On the upper right is a former graduate student of mine. Uh, she came as an undergraduate to Iowa State uh, first. And uh, I just, just before Christmas, as a matter of fact, uh, I was on her, she was working on her PhD out at, at uh, Oregon State. And uh, um, uh, she completed her PhD. I did her final exam by remote uh, with, you, know, you know, over the web, and it's like, what? <laughs> this is weird stuff. So I was able to, to complete her final exam uh, uh, remotely uh, from, from, uh, uh, from, from Ames. So, uh, but she, this is, uh, we were with uh, Quilombolos in, uh, in Brazil. The Quilombolos were, um, uh, were people who were uh, escaped slaves. Um, they, they escaped what translates to beyond the waterfalls. Uh, the Portuguese bought, brought slaves to Brazil to work in the sugarcane fields. And uh, so some of the slaves, uh, they have a long history of slavery. 
and, and just as we did. And, and so those, some of those slaves escaped beyond the waterfalls, went way up on the Amazon, and they thought they had died. Well, 400 years later, some of their villages that they established 400 years ago uh, were found, <laughs> and they'd been living all this time. So the Quilombolos um, uh, were part of the Amazon system. Sometimes government in its, in its wisdom does some things that are un have unintended consequences, and the Quilombolos have been one of those unintended consequences. They declared the Amazon uh, basin to be um, a, a national park in the kinds of things that we've done in the past, sort of in the, in the model of the U.S. national park system. Unfortunately, they thought no one lived there, but a lot of people did. And they said, well, national parks, we can't have people living there. So they sort of threw them out. So the Quilombos over the last 30 years have been moved around several times and, and just sort of discarded people. And we had the fortune, great fortune to spend a day with them um, uh, as they'd been moved the third time. And you can see the, the American clothes they have on and everything. Uh, um, uh, they get given lots of stuff, but they're, they're exceedingly poor. And they still live in existence that is basically slice and burn agriculture um, on, on a 10 hectare uh, uh, area. So we spent the day with them, and it was a very, very emotional, um, uh, fulfilling uh, uh, day to spend with them. The lower left hand corner are, are, is a, a, a place in Panama. Um, uh, with a tribe that uh, we went up the Moog River uh, in, in a dugout canoe, uh, and we spent three days uh, with them. I had the students, had students from both Iowa State, um, Cornell University, and the University of California, Davis, and uh, had them doing interviews uh, in pairs. Now, some of the, the, the Spanish uh, of these students is um, Un poquito, you know, <laughs> so, so they only know a little, uh, but they figured out ways to communicate uh, and pairs with these people in the interview. And sure enough, depending on, uh, I asked them, they were asking questions about what the value of ecotourism was to these, these people. And, and of course, they, uh, they found, depending on who they interviewed, it was really a really good thing or a really bad thing or somewhere in between. And, and it pointed out that, that uh, to them, I think very directly, that depending where you are in a community, changes in that community can have both positive and negative impacts on the community. So it was a really interesting uh, 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 trip for them. We helped them on the lower right, we helped them actually during the day. One of the days, um, they were growing maize, and, and that's pretty tall corn, you know? Uh, and they, they grow it in a, in a slice and burn kind of way. Slice and burn sounds really awful, but what they're doing is they have about a 10 hectare um, uh, place within the jungle, and they'll farm about one hectare a year. And then a year later, the, the, the following growing season, they move to the next hectare. And so it's only every 10 years they come back to the same part where they have to cut out the trees. It's not, it's not like they're constantly cutting the forest. These folks are doing a subsistence living in, in a tropical area where the soils are not necessarily great for agriculture. Although, if you look at that, you say, that corn's pretty darn high. Uh, but all the work is hand done, it's hand planted, hand weeded, and uh, hand harvested. And so we were helping them one day in the machete and understanding that this is their daily life. Uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing uh, uh, to see that. In Costa Rica, uh, is a place that I've been many, many times. I think now over 25 times. I'm, I'm not certain. I've lost track. It's, it's an incredibly diverse area. It has 12 different life zones. 12 different life zones, okay? In a very small area that goes from coastal lowlands all the way up to alpine, called Paramo, um, uh, alpine environments, uh, over 14,000 feet. So it is really an amazingly diverse area. They have um, uh, 10,000 or more plant species. They're still identifying them. In fact, uh, I've been with, with other biologists when they've come across a new orchid species they've never seen before. You know, it's, it's, it's not uncommon at all to see new species. They have 850 bird species, uh, all these, these uh, uh, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, over 500 of them, and just freshwater fishes that we know of, and this is an environment that we're still getting to know, 130 freshwater uh, fish species. 
And an area is about the third, a third the size of Iowa. That's incredible. It's about a third the size of Iowa. But like other places I've been, like in Taiwan, we, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a place that has 23 million people uh, in Taiwan and uh, a tropical place and they grow all of their own food. They're food self-sufficient. And they are about a third the size of Iowa. How do they do it? And they, they go from, from sea level up to about uh, 12,000 feet. Okay. How do they do that? How do they do that? Well, it's very intensive agriculture in the tropics. You can grow stuff all year round. Um, uh, so you think about these areas. It's not so much a matter of um, what they have. It's about the, 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 the life zones they go through. Let's compare them to Iowa here. Uh, we had about 400 bird species, and that includes both the ones that nested here and the ones that travel through here on migration. 70 uh, mammal species at the, at the most, and about 69 reptiles and amphibians. And we only had four distinct um, uh, habitat types, wetlands, prairies, savannas, and, and uh, woodlands. And of course, we changed all that. I was the most altered uh, state in the Union. That's not a value judgment, it's just saying we are the most altered. We have altered more of our land. 99.9% uh, .9 of the prairies that were once here are now gone. Even though we've come back and restored a lot, just like right outside our windows here, uh, they've done a really good job of recreate, trying to recreate the prairie, but recreating the diversity that was there is impossible. Uh, a, a given square mile of prairie land in Iowa once had over 250 species of plants on a given square, square mile. We have a, a great deal of difficulty finding and planting and getting to grow more than 60 or 70 species, let alone 250. So, so recreating uh, those, we, we do a pretty good job and sometimes uh, uh, we, as, as much as, we do as good a job as we can with the, the, the seed and the techniques that we have available. But to think about that, that comparison, so three times the size of Costa Rica in the tropics, but you know, a fraction of the number of species that were there. And by the way, some of those birds, that, uh, the 400 birds, spend the winter in the tropics. Those um, warblers that you get to see come back, or the uh, orioles or the hummingbirds, they're down there right now. Um, uh, I, every spring I listen for the, the orioles and I, uh, I can hear them and I, they, they pick up a little bit of Spanish, you know, <laughs> while, they're, while they're down there. And uh, I, I think when I'm down there and I see Baltimore Orioles, I think, oh, they have an Iowa accent, you know. <laughs> so so they, they really are uh, pretty, pretty spectacular. So why, is, why the difference? Well, it's a matter of location, just like uh, real estate anywhere. It's location, location, location. Um, uh, the topography, particularly in Costa Rica, is very important. As I said, they go from sea level to over 14,000 feet. When you have that variety in, in um, uh, altitude, it creates incredibly different habitats. We were in Ecuador last year, and we birded at three different altitudes. We birded at um, 5,000 feet, at 7,000 feet, and at around 9,000 feet. Totally different communities of birds in each one of those. So as you go up, the habitats change. So having this kind of top topographical difference from, from sea level to you know, 14,000 feet creates this amazing diversity uh, in itself. And then also, the uh, Costa Rica in particular was a land bridge, is the land bridge between two major continents. So uh, it, it's right, uh, it, it, it was created volcanically, connecting North and South, reconnecting, I should say, North and South America. And that land bridge means that it's often the southernmost extent of many North American species and the northernmost extent of many South American species. So that location means, wow, this is an amazing place for biodiversity, and it really is. Um, the other thing that's really important is to think about how much of it is protected. Depending on who you talk to, whether they're politicians or the biologists, uh, <laughs> uh, you get different different uh, uh, estimates. And I would say, from the air, 
It's probably somewhere, uh, politicians will say, oh, we have a quarter of our land uh, uh, protected, you know. Well, it's probably not that high. In some areas, it's much, much lower than that. Uh, and some will say, well, we only have 12% protected. Well, it's probably a little more than that. So somewhere 18, 19% is probably in some form of protection. How much of Iowa is protected in places like this, either public or private? How much? One-tenth of 1%. Yeah, one-tenth of 1%. That's a prairie. That's a prairie. Um, but Iowa has about, as you can see, 2%. 2%, depending on how you calculate that. I've seen calculations up to 3%. And that's in public ownership, okay? Um, I once was at a, I was giving a, um, a presentation at a, a grazing conference in Northwest Iowa. And before the conference really got started, I was hearing all these conversations. Oh, and they were cussing the government for owning all this land and everything. And I, I thought, my golly, where do they get this idea? It's all coffee shop talk, of course, and it's not true. Iowa is next to last in the nation in the percent of our land that is in public ownership, and that includes county, state, or federal lands. We are next to last in the nation in the percent of our land. The only state that has lower uh, percentages than we do is Rhode Island, okay? And they're a much smaller state, too, besides, but percentage of land. Yeah? Don't we also have a lot of land in private ownership that Bingo. Funded or supported. Excellent. Excellent point. And that's exactly right. We make up for that a little bit, although we don't come anywhere near to 12%. But we have a lot of private landowners who really believe in, in, in protecting that land, that that land, just like this farm that we're sitting on, the Grimeses really believed that this should be, uh, they wanted it to be there for the future. So organizations like the County Conservation Boards, the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation, hold easements on a lot of private land. And then in addition, conservation easements, and then in addition, there are a lot of private landowners, perhaps some of you here, uh, who decided we really want this land um, uh, to be uh, protected for the future and we're gonna make sure that it is. And there are other ways of, of doing that. But a lot of people have conservation easements that help protect a lot of private land as well. You're exactly right. So, um, so but in terms of publicly owned land, uh, county, state, or federal, 2% is all we have. That's not very much, very small percentage. So don't let anybody fool you. Well, on these trips, we've seen these spectacular critters. Uh, some of the birds, the birds in the upper right-hand corner, uh, the, anybody know what that one is? It used to be called chestnut mandibled, mandible is the, the jaw, okay? Chestnut mandibled toucan, toucan. Uh, and, they, and when they fly, they look like, um, they're holding a banana in their beak when <laughs> they're flying through the air. They're huge beaks. They changed it to a black mandible, and now the most recent change was they're called golden chest, golden necked, golden, go, yeah, golden chested or something like that. I, why do they keep changing the names? It drives me crazy. So it's not a black mandible, that's a chestnut mandible. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, they, 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 I think new young ornithologists come in and they have to make a name for themselves, so they change the names. <laughs> Sometimes there are species reasons for doing it, but oftentimes there's not. This is uh, one of the hummingbirds. There are over 60 species of hummingbirds in uh, Costa Rica, and I've seen quite a few of them. Um, this one is a Green violet ear, green violet ear, okay? Uh, and the green violet, and this is a male, obviously. He's showing off, you know? He's ex extending those, uh, uh, those feathers on his side to say, hey, I am pretty hot, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, you, you gals come my way, you know, because I am the most beautiful one in the area. Uh, and and uh, it, there are lots and lots of species of hummingbirds. And you go to other parts of the tropics. When we were in Ecuador, birding at those three different altitudes, we saw 30, uh, 34 species of hummingbirds, not birding very hard at all, 28 of which we'd never seen before. <laughs> so it was really like, oh my gosh, we thought we'd seen a lot of hummingbirds in, in Costa Rica, but we saw them at different altitudes uh, in, in Ecuador as well. So it's just, there are so many species, it's just, it's incredible. And each one is very well adapted for a little, tiny part of that very diverse ecosystem. This one has a beak about oh, two inches long and a slightly curved. 
made perfectly for getting into certain species of heliconia to get the nectar out of heliconias. Um, uh, others have beaks that are more like a, uh, like a C, okay? And they is, uh, 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 can get into flowers that are curved like that. Their beak allows them to get all the way into that nectar. It's amazing. Those little tiny niches, those little places within the jungle that allow them to uh, survive. Lots of butterflies as well. This is a, a bird of paradise, in fact. And you can see this is, this is one called a clear wing butterfly. Clear wing butterfly, and there are lots and lots of species of these. And uh, th they, uh, again, are adapted perfectly for different kinds of flowers uh, uh, in, in these tropics. Here are some more of the, the, the critters in the upper right-hand corner. This is a little guy. He's about the size of my thumbnail, okay? They're really tiny. Uh, one of the, the many species of, of frogs. Frogs are one of the first things we've noticed that have undergone a lot of change. Um, there are many species that are already apparently extinct uh, within, within the tropics. The climate change they're very, very sensitive to, and um, not only in terms of temperatures and humidity, but it also allows things to grow, uh, other parasites and fungi and that, and it's caused a lot of problems with many, many species. Uh, this species is more adaptable. This is called the blue jeans frog, uh, and it's a, a, it's a tree frog. This happens to be a male. It's only the male's frogs, just like here, only the male frogs sing. And he actually climbs. Uh, he, they spend a lot of time on the ground, which is where we see him here. He's in the leaf of, um, uh, of a bromeliad. What they do is they put, uh, the females lay the eggs, of course, and he attaches, the, uh, one at a time, um, a, a tadpole to his back. And he climbs up the trees, 40, 50, 60, 70 feet up, and deposits that little tadpole in the tank of a bromeliad that is filled with water. And that's where the, uh, uh, the little tadpoles uh, develop into adults, is in the water of those bromeliads where they get mosquito larvae and other things to, uh, to come. It's pretty, pretty amazing. This particular frog is not as sensitive as many other species are, so they're still pretty abundant. Um, but uh, uh, lots of other species have virtually disappeared from, uh, from many of the tropical forests. The guy on the left is uh, one of the species of sloths, um, and boy, they're, they're fascinating. My last trip to Brazil, or, or to um, Costa Rica, last January, uh, everybody wanted to see a sloth, and I'd never guarantee a sloth, <laughs> because sometimes they're there and we just don't see them, uh, but many times we don't see them. We didn't see them at all uh, when we were there in January, and uh, so I sent them pictures from previous trips. It wasn't the same, though. I it didn't quite do it. Uh, but uh, sloths are, are incredibly well adapted to climbing around. They spend a lot of time hanging around in the trees by their claws, especially uh, special toes for, for being able to hang on. And they're really, so we, we had one in a rainstorm, a tree had come down, a sloth had fallen out of it, and he was running across the road. <laughs> Going as fast as he could go <laughs> across that road. That's full speed for a sloth, because their whole metabolism is slowed way, way down. Uh, they come down once a week or so to defecate and uh, bury it in the soil, and then they climb back up the trees again. So they're, they're really pretty amazing. They have over 100 species of insects living on them. Uh, so, and who knows how many species of algae that grow in special grooves on their hairs uh, that the, in, many of the insects uh, eat as well. So they're, uh, they're a whole ecosystem, the sloth ecosystem, as it were, uh, 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 all, in their, all in their own. In fact, in, in Spanish, if you want to insult someone, you, you say the Spanish word for sloth, you go, perezoso. You perezoso, you are slothful. <laughs> so it's a, it's a real insult, in fact. So, uh, so Craig, don't take it personally, OK? Uh, so, um, uh, there are pigs down there too. Certainly there are domestic pigs, but this is a wild progenitor. This is a peccary. We have a relative in, uh, in the southwestern United States uh, in the deserts down there, but uh, this happens to be, um, uh, uh, let me think, 
Which one is this? This is the uh, white-collared peccary, white-collared peccary. And then this is one of the many, many species of lizards, many species of lizards uh, that grow down there, everywhere from to this guy. This guy is one of the ones that uh, is a basculus lizard, runs across the water. You see them, whenever they do the nature program, uh, at the beginning and the end, you'll see the, the lizard running across the water and grabbing the morpho, but the bright blue butterfly out of, uh, that's, that's one of these lizards. This is a, uh, also called the Jesus Christ lizard because they walk on water. They, they go really fast, you know, and they do have special scales for staying on top of the water as much as, but they have to do it fast or they would sink as well. But, uh, so this is one of the basilisk lizards uh, uh, as well. Lots and lots of other birds as well, but you have to be there at the right time. Here's a lizard on the right. This is called the um, uh, 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 spiny lizard, one of the spiny lizards. This is an owl on the left, about this big, a little bigger than, uh, than our screech owls here. Uh, this is a crested, crested owl, deep, deep in the jungle. They only um, uh, roost about this high off the ground, uh, head height off the ground. So finding them in the dense undergrowth can be, uh, can be difficult. Lots and lots of uh, other fascinating critters that uh, uh, the, the one on the left is a white-throated mountain gem, another hummingbird, a guy on the, on the left whose toes, each toes about, this is a bird about this high, maybe 10 inches high, okay? Not, not a big bird at all, but he's a bird of the marshes and each toe is about three inches long and they're used for walking on top of the lily pads and the mud flats without sinking in. It's like having, you know, wonderful snowshoes to, uh, to keep you on top. Another hummingbird down here, this is a volcano hummingbird, little tiny, almost bumblebee sized hummingbird. Uh, just, just a tiny, tiny, this is a female. And then the guy in the upper right hand corner is one of the herons. We don't have these here. This is a tiger heron, uh, a bare throated tiger heron that uh, spends a lot of time standing there staring into the water waiting for something to go by, and then grabbing it very quickly with a, with a, a, a beak. Amazing, amazing birds. Uh, here are a couple more. The one on the right is one of my favorites because you hear them often in the jungles. And they're pretty widespread. This is the blue-crowned motmot. Motmot is a, 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 a family of birds that we don't have here, but we have some relatives. We have them along most of our Iowa rivers, You've heard them, I'm sure if you've been on the rivers at all, you've no doubt seen them. They're relatives of kingfishers. Kingfishers, our belted kingfisher, is a relative of the motmot. You can see the big bill and everything, except these guys use their bill for two different things. They use it for, for grabbing lizards instead of fish, but they also use it for digging, just like our kingfishers. Our kingfishers nest in tunnels, in, in um, mud banks. Okay, they'll come back every spring, uh, dig a tunnel, often two to three meters into a mud bank. I don't know if you knew that or not. And they put their nest way back in there. These guys do the same thing, except because they're in the tropics, they're there year round. So in the rainy season, when the soil is really wet, easier to work, that's when they dig their nest. Then they come back after the rainy season, find their nest and nest in there, okay? Their tunnels are often, oh, a meter or two back into the, uh, uh, into the, the bank. But uh, so other than that, but they have this wonderful little racket tail. And there's been lots of speculation as to what that's for. If you were a biologist researching motmots, what would you think that racket tail would be for? What would you, oh, for going back and forth? Maybe it helps flying into the ocean. Okay, all right. Another idea? Attracting a mate. Do we? Attracting a mate. Oh, it might be for attracting a mate, yeah. And, and you might display it in some way, so, okay. Right. Any other ideas? What else could it be? Balance. Balance, <laughs> yeah, be a good thing, okay? Balance, yeah. It's probably all those things, but we don't yet know. It used to think, used to be thought that they use it for attracting lizards. They would wave it back and forth, but it turned out when the biologists got into blinds and really watched them for a long, because these birds spend a lot of time just sitting, waiting for lizards to come around. They eat animals and, and lots of other smaller lizards. And uh, once they started watching them over a longer period of time, they found out they didn't always wave that. 
It was only when the researchers were present and they were nervous that that data would go back and forth. <laughs> so there went that idea. You know? <laughs> so we really don't know why they have it. But it has uh, it, these little wide rackets at the end and these, the, par the parts of the feathers that stick out above that tend to break off very early after they grow that feather in, when, or that, those tail feathers in when they're very young. Uh, in the upper left are, uh, of course, uh, scarlet macaws. Scarlet macaws are, the macaws are these big parrots uh, uh, that are just spectacular. And you would think a bright red bird would be easy to find. Well, when they're flying over, they are. You often see them and hear them because the macaws have a call. They're very noisy. And then they'll land in a green tree. You think, red bird, green tree, ought to be easy to find. Not so. <laughs> They seem to disappear behind the leaves. It's amazing how you can lose them uh, in a palm or other, other trees. Um, uh, but they all have in common that, that hooked beak that all the parrots, uh, uh, in all of parakeets uh, have, parrotlets, uh, and they use that beak um, uh, to peel the skins off of, 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 uh, 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 of fruits, including Palm nuts. Palm nuts have a, 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 a seed inside with a very tough um, uh, husk on it, and they're able to use that. Uh, they'll hold it with one, with one foot while they're balancing on the other, hold, hold it with the uh, other, other and, and peel, that, uh, uh, peel that, that husk off. This, is a, um, uh, uh, this happens to be a crocodile. There are um, certainly alligators in the tropics. If you've been to Florida, you've seen alligators there. Uh, there are crocodiles, this is a crocodile, and there are caimans, which are relatives more or less of alligators, okay, they're smaller. And uh, uh, depending on their size and their ability, these are very, very ancient reptiles that go back a long, long ways. Uh, and, and virtually, like turtles, virtually unchanged in 150 million years. It's pretty incredible. Well-adapted, big predators. The giant ones um, are, can be 12 to 15, 16 feet long. That's a really big crocodile. I don't go swimming with them, okay? Caimans, on the other hand, most of the caimans are much smaller. I'll show you one a little later. Uh, anywhere from three to six feet long. And they tend to be more interested in fish, not, uh, not humans. Um, uh, predators are, are important, including spiders, lots and lots of spiders. This is one of the big orb weavers. This is the female. She sits in the middle of these big orbs, and the male is a little tiny guy. Uh, I don't think he's in that, no, he's not in that picture. I sometimes have gotten males. And you can imagine when he comes home, he's like, honey, I'm home, you know. Uh, he wants to make sure that he knows, or she knows that he's another spider and that he's friendly. In fact, he's a male. Uh, because if um, she doesn't like him, uh, she just eats him. You know, that's all there's to it. So, so they, don't, uh, they don't mess around very much. So, uh, uh, up, upper right hand corner, lots and lots of insects uh, uh, as well. This is a representative of, of one. It's a very important in the tropics, and that's handling all the dung from the many species that are there. And these are dung beetles, okay? They're rolling up the dung, laying eggs in it, burying it in such a way that when the eggs hatch out, they have a, a, a source of nutrients uh, right there. One of the many crabs that are found in the tropics um, uh, uh, as well. Some of them are land crabs, some of them are, are sea crabs, depending on, on, of course, on where they are. And here's another one of those clear wing butterflies. I don't know if you can see that in there. He's, uh, you can see right through the wings. They're pretty, pretty amazing little guys. <coughs> another... Um, uh, heron there, there's a croc. Man, I, they, uh, I have a friend down there, he calls himself Crocodile Man. Uh, this is in Costa Rica. And he puts on shows for tourists. I tell him, when we go out in his boat, I say, no show. We don't want any show. We just want to go bird watching, okay? And so we do. But when the other tourists are there that really like this stuff, he, uh, he gets out in the water with raw chickens, okay? Dead chickens. And stands there while the croc comes up and he holds it up and feeds the croc. You know, this is a 12 foot long croc. I, it's crazy. One day I found him on the beach. He was walking along and he had his arm all bandaged. <laughs> and I said, 
did they have to reattach it? And he said, no, but I got a little too close. <laughs> he almost had it ripped off. So it was not a smart thing to do, but teeth like that, you don't mess around with them. Here's a um, uh, mango hummingbird on, uh, on a nest. Notice, just like our hummingbirds, though, those nests, those nests are really tiny, just like the ruby-throated hummingbirds that we have here. They're often made out of lichens and mosses, and they tie them to the branch using spider webs. Spider webs, they collect those spider webs. Our, our, uh, if you ever find a, um, a hummingbird nest here, they're very hard to find, but if you find one here, take a look at them very closely, and you'll see how they're laced to the branch using spider webs. It's just amazing. This is a, a, another a species of um, uh, tree frog that's actually well with the changes in the climate. You can see the tree frog because they have uh, suction cups you know, that hang on uh, to plants and, and, and trees as they climb up. And uh, this one is quite a bit bigger. He's more the size of our gray tree frog uh, that we have here in Iowa. And uh, as the climate has changed, he's actually done pretty well. Their populations are increasing. So not everything changes in a, a negative direction. For some species, it's a, mu a much more positive, black, green and black frog. Any idea, the one in the upper left-hand corner, what's a, a good relative of that one? And it's a toucan, exactly. And this is called the emerald toucanet. Now you look at those bills and you say, they must be for eating fruit. They're also a predator. It turns out they take those bills and they will put them into cavities or into hanging nests and they eat nestlings and eggs as well. <laughs> they do eat fruit, but they also use them in the uh, emerald toucanet, as beautiful as they are. They're an amazing predator on, uh, on, on other birds' nests. Lots of snakes. Uh, this particular one is only about as big around as, oh, maybe my index finger, uh, called an eyelash viper. And they're called that not because they're often at eye level, and they are, uh, but because they have this scale that sticks out over their eye, like an eyelash. Um, uh, quite poisonous, and uh, they sit for long periods of time, and they're bright yellow to tell you they're there. Uh, so they're warning you, don't get too close, uh, but they do. This guy in the lower right is uh, uh, the one that so many birders go to Costa Rica and, and other Central American countries for go to the tropics, this is the resplendent quetzal. It's a group of birds. We only have one representative in the U.S. Gets up as uh, far as, as southern Arizona, uh, parts of Texas sometimes. It's in the family of birds called trogons. The trogons are really, really important for the biodiversity of uh, the jungle because they eat fruits and they spend a lot of time sitting in one place, um, kind of working over the fruits that they eat in their stomachs. And then they'll fly off and they regurgitate those seeds. And so the spreading of those seeds is a really, really important. And in fact, during the process of getting the flesh off the, uh, uh, the seeds, or the, the fruit, uh, they tend to scarify those, those seeds, scratch the seed coat so that they can sprout once they regurgitate them out. So they're really, really important uh, in terms of spreading uh, different species uh, in, in the, uh, other, all around the jungle and making, making trees be allowed to, uh, to spread. You notice the long tail, this is a male, and uh, the resplendent quetzal is an amazing bird. They, they nest in holes, like all the trogons do. But they nest in, in holes, and look at that beak, and it's kind of like, it's not a woodpecker type beak. So they can only excavate a hole in very rotten trees. So that tree might be there for a year or two. It's often an old palm that is just, just barely standing, you know, and they're, they're rotten enough that they'll, they'll excavate it and they, they put, put their eggs in there. And the male incubates them as well. And you look at that long tail and say, how does a male with that long tail incubate? Well, he curls it around him. So often he gets in the nest and the feathers are sticking out, <laughs> tail feathers are sticking out the front of the nest. So you can kind of tell where they are, it's kind of neat. And uh, uh, they're, they're, they both participate in the incubation, but they're just absolutely spectacular. Um, with the tail, they can be about that long. They're just amazing birds. And uh, it's one that many people go to see, to put on their life list to check off. Oh, I've seen a quetzal. So 
take lots of people. Uh, I've, I've been very fortunate over the years to take um, dozens and dozens of students and, and, uh, and now dozens and dozens of people, some of which are here today <laughs> that have been with me on, on, uh, uh, on trips. There are other mammals as well. This one, you recognize this one? The largest, yeah, capybara. This is the largest rodent in the world. My wife loves these guys because they live in family groups. And I keep saying to her, think rodents. And, you know, these are pig size. These are big critters. The adults are, are definitely uh, 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 large, large mammals. But they, uh, here's a young one nursing, and she goes, isn't that cute? And I, well, <laughs> it's a face that I guess only a mother could love. <laughs> uh, they really are, they're kind of homely, but they're, they're cute in a, in a way. So capybaras are, um, are a prime prey item for all kinds of the large predators that are in the tropics. Uh, uh, they're not a large predator for this guy, uh, uh, or a, a prey for this guy, but this is a fairly large predator. However, he's only about four or five feet long. This is a caiman. And he's, is he showing you his teeth for a reason? Ah, he's thermoregulating. He's cooling down. He's basking on a beach, getting a little too warm. So he opens up his mouth, and you notice how pink it is inside? That means the inside, it, they don't sweat. So instead, they pump blood into those blood vessels around the lining of the mouth, and that they allow the wind to go through it, and that's how they cool off. Uh, so he's actually not being, uh, you know, he's smiling or anything like that. He's just taking care, making sure his temperature stays about where he wants it. Uh, another predator in some of the rivers, this one, uh, both this one and the Cayman were actually from, uh, from Brazil. Um, <clears throat> this is a giant otter. These are the uh, about twice the size of our river otters. We're talking two meters long, okay, six, over six feet long. Uh, and they have a tail that is, uh, is flattened, and they use that for locomotion. And these guys are uh, hunting family groups, just like our otters do. Uh, each one has a different pattern. Many of the members of this family, the mustelids, including mink, um, weasels, uh, wolverines, Badgers, uh, Fisher, Martin, uh, all those are the North American species uh, and, and otters, but many of them have different patterns on their throat. Martins, for example, will have uh, orange patterns. And they're individual, very individual. So you can tell individuals based on the pattern on their throat. It's a genetic uh, difference between them. So this particular individual was uh, one of a family group. This guy is quite old. He's, uh, they, they know him is at least 10 years old. It's unusual for large predators to last that long in the tropics, but uh, he does. Um, other, other things, this is also from a recent Brazil trip. These, uh, this is a stork that stands, when they're standing next to you, if you can stand next to them, they're about that high. This is a big stork. So that beak is about that long. They, they use it to catch fish, but they also then plunge it very deeply into the soils, coming up with eels that are living in the marshes uh, along there. This is called the jabiru, jabiru stork. Uh, my most recent trip to Brazil, we called it jaguars, jabiru's, and jacarés. Uh, jacaré is a, 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 the Portuguese name for, uh, uh, for the caimans. So we had uh, all of those. Here's the big predator that a lot of people go for. And uh, in uh, the largest freshwater wetland in the world, it's on the border between Brazil and uh, Bolivia, is called the Pantanal, the Pantanal. The Pantanal is a very complex uh, system, but it uh, uh, yearly goes from uh, being very dry to having two meters to three meters of water on it. You know, so the, it's a perennially flooded, but it's that, um, uh, that, that, that flooding that is so critical, absolutely critical, for producing that rich fishery that supports every other uh, 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 part of, the, of that whole ecosystem. The jaguar is at the top of the ecosystem. Uh, we got to see the last trip, when we were there in November, we saw four different jaguars. It was really spectacular. And uh, uh, seeing these guys, they're also individually marked, so they can tell them apart. This particular guy, um, 
I see the red on his uh, face. He'd gotten a little fresh with his mother uh, and tried to take a prey away from her. And she decided he was big enough to find his own. And so she taught him a lesson and gave him a good swipe across the face. Uh, slap, I call it. <laughs> and uh, left a little scar behind. So he was still sort of, uh, you know, kind of moping around uh, uh, a lot. Uh, so this particular jaguar uh, is a full-grown male. And uh, the, these um, uh, big cats are a really important part of that ecosystem. They're at the, at the top of the food chain. Uh, they eat capybaras, they eat caimans, uh, they eat tapers, they eat all kinds of things. Anything that they can get enough uh, meat. They'll eat smaller things too if they have to, but they really will go after, they'll eat otters if they can. Um, you can go on YouTube, if you're uh, good at searching YouTube, you can go on YouTube and, and uh, find, if you look at, if you search for jaguar hunting caiman, you'll see a famous uh, a relative of this guy, in fact, uh, a very famous uh, uh, video of a jaguar getting in the water, swimming across to a beach, sneaking up and grabbing a caiman, and in one bite, in one bite, going through that very heavy armor on the back of its head and killing the caiman and then carrying it off. This is a big caiman, <laughs> six foot long caiman, carrying it off, swimming across the water and taking it up the bank. That's amazing how strong they are. Uh, so they're, they're, uh, they're pretty spectacular, and seeing them is a real joy. One of the reasons I take people to the Pantanal is, is that they're, um, it's, it's, a, it's a river system, and the river has been fished for many years, and so they pay no attention to boats. <laughs> the fishermen have never bothered them, so they don't, they, they don't bother running away. So the, their primary prey, the caiman and the capybaras, are right along those gallery forests of the rivers, and so the jaguars are as well. So that's where you see them, and you can go up in a boat, and as long as you're quiet and sit quietly and everything, they'll stay right there. So seeing, this is actually from a boat, probably, oh, 35 yards away. So they're very close. <laughs> it's very cool to be that close to see how powerful uh, muscle they are. And this subspecies is uh, the largest of all the subspecies of jaguars. Uh, because they're ready prey, they don't have to climb trees, they don't have to go very far for their prey. It's a very rich system, but it depends on something that as humans, we often don't like, and that's flooding. That system has to flood every year to re-enrich that fishery, to bring it back, in order to support the kind of diversity that we have here. So we look often at these systems and we say, gee, uh, what's in it for me? And flooding is not one of those things we like because it's not as predictable. Uh, and it destroys stuff that we like. But when we look at it from an ecological standpoint, it supports this amazing richness. Uh, so we have to think about that. Uh, one of the plans of the um, uh, just reinstalled uh, or newly installed uh, president of Brazil is to uh, dam that system. Just really, <laughs> I want to take him and shake him and say, come with me, let me show you uh, uh, what you would be destroying. So it's, it's, uh, it's a, a big controversy, of course, not just there, all over the world. This is a cat that we have occasionally here in Iowa, comes through. We used to have them here as a native species. This particular one happens to be in Chile, but it used to be, uh, it stretches all the way from Tierra de Fuego in South America, it's the most wide-ranging cat in the world, clear up into uh, um, Canada and even parts of, of, of Alaska. This is a mountain lion, also known as cougar, puma, catamount, um, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, things. So it is, it is a, a, a very wide-ranging cat and uh, very important in that ecosystem. This particular one, as I say, was in Chile, not in the tropics, but they go through right through the tropics. Uh, they compete for species with other big cats like the jaguars, uh, and uh, is one of many, many top predators uh, in the tropics. So we've seen some spectacular sights uh, from uh, volcanoes. And of course, the, the central part of, of uh, that land bridge was very much built by volcanoes. Um, the Hawaiian islands, the tropical islands, the, uh, the Galapagos were all built from volcanoes. They are volcano built. 
And so the soils are very different than other parts of the tropics. Uh, this particular volcano is in uh, Costa Rica, it's called Arenal, and uh, was active up until 2010. We used to take people there to see an active volcano. We're going to a different place so when I go back uh, because uh, another volcano is shoot, uh, the uh, volcano um, um, Turialba is, is, is uh, releasing the pressure on this one, and this one is kind of sitting there now quietly waiting for the next time when uh, it shifts again. Um, uh, there are cultural sites that we, we look at. Because so much of Central and South America was um, uh, uh, under uh, uh, rule by the Spanish and the Portuguese, both of which were dominated by um, uh, the Catholic Church, um, Catholicism has formed an awful lot of the cultural uh, significance of Central and South America. And so we, we look at some of the sites that uh, are there. This particular one is in, is in Brazil. Uh, and uh, uh, this happens to be a portion of the Amazon uh, from an old um, archaeological site there called uh, Monte Alegre. And uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, cultural diversity of, of sites. Lots and lots of, uh, of plants as well, uh, species of orchids and species of uh, uh, Cecropia, uh, again another tropical plant that you may have in your room and uh, gotten to show it to lots and lots of, of, of folks. Are you guys in there? I'm not sure you are. This is um, uh, students. Uh, that's an adult group, that's uh, or older adult group, and that's an older adult group. I don't know if you guys are in either one of those pictures. So you recognize anybody in there? No? Okay. <laughs> uh, so I've gotten to show it to lots of people. And you say, well, why do you to take people? These are some of my favorite places in the world. And just like the politicians, I think it's important that other folks see these places and understand how important they are. This is the tropics. This is a, 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 a sort of the, the life belt of the, the center of the planet. Um, I think it's really critical that we uh, uh, get to, to, whoops, I did go, get to uh, uh, see it. Taking my wife along on many of these, we've been very, very lucky even while I was taking students Often places I would go, she eventually would get to, uh, uh, to go with me. So she's, uh, uh, this is, happens to be in one of our favorite streams in the highlands of, uh, uh, of Costa Rica. So we have lots of special places uh, around the world. What have I learned? Well, I've learned lots of things. Um, these are places of incredible natural beauty. Um, and they also are very, very rich in, in natural resources, which people want to naturally exploit for all kinds of reasons, to make a living. They have to live there as well. Um, there is no free lunch. We can't, uh, I've, I've talked to a lot to our students. Uh, I used to talk about how ecotourism is a double-edged sword. Yes, it brings uh, people and, and money and uh, uh, Im important investment. It allows people in some of these tropical areas to save the forest, to make sure that they don't wipe out the species because people are coming to see them and paying to do that. So that's the, the positive side. But there is no free lunch. We go there, we like to ride on roads that aren't, 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 aren't dangerous, uh, that uh, don't fall off, uh, uh, that aren't too bumpy, that we can get there fairly quickly. We like to have hot showers, we like to eat. Uh, at least three times a day, uh, sometimes more. Uh, so, so all those things are costs as well to that economy. Yeah, there's a plus side in terms of employment and in terms of all those things, but there's a negative side as well. Uh, it, it's not without its consequences. So uh, in order to make a living, they have to find a way, find that balance somehow between conservation and utilization. And uh, many other places have, uh, uh, there are lots of ways of doing it. I was telling you earlier about Taiwan. Taiwan has 23, 20, 24 million people now, I think, uh, in, in a small island about a third the size of Iowa. And yet they're able to be food self-sufficient. Now they use the sea as well, that's a big part of it, no question. But they have a third of their land in permanent national park protection. How can they do that? Serving seven, eight times as many people as we have in Iowa. Their food's so self-sufficient. Well, one of the things is that they're in the tropics so that they can grow crops year-round. They do very intensive farming. They've also learned how to live in smaller spaces than we do. Um, 
uh, very intensive. But they found a way between this balance between, uh, they found that they need a balance between, um, between making a, a, a living and having other living things there with them. When I would walk to work in the morning uh, from my apartment in Taipei, I walked to the, to the bus, and every little green space, green space is much smaller than this room, there'd be people there making use of that green space, doing Tai Chi and other things early, early in the morning. And those green spaces are really valuable to the Taiwanese because they're at such a premium. I think in Iowa, we're approaching that. We have so little public land, we tend to pretty well value even the really small places that we have. At least I hope we do, uh, because that's the only way they're gonna be safe for the future. We can learn a lot if we, if we, looking at other cultures, seeing what they're doing. If we're open to it, we can learn a lot about how they find that, that balance. Tropical forests provide lots of things. Recent uh, study put out by the World Wildlife Fund and some others, uh, they estimate the tropical forests give us $125 trillion of ecosystem services every year for the kinds of things, that uh, carbon storage, uh, water, uh, clean water, oxygen, $125 trillion annually in ecosystem services. That's amazing. Very hard to estimate. If you listen to a report yesterday on uh, NPR, uh, finding just how much carbon storage a tree gives is very difficult to measure. So these are estimates, but still, even at that, that's pretty amazing. Um, they give us that biological and genetic diversity that, uh, uh, that I think gives us some options somewhere down the road. Who knows? We may need um, the genes of this one plant for solving uh, um, a cancer. For example, in the United States, an endangered species of plant. Uh, of you in the, in the uh, uh, northwestern part of the United States has been uh, used as a, a cancer treatment now, coming from one plant. We didn't know that 25 years ago. Wow, think how much is in the tropics. We need those options. We need to save those places so that we have, as a species on this planet, have some options for future generations. So it gives us some wild places for an unknown wild future. Um, uh, as we move from 7 billion people to 10 billion people, some things are going to start changing. Uh, certainly the impact on our wild areas is going to be substantial, so we need to have those options um, uh, available to us. And I found out that uh, I think that people need wild places uh, very much. E.O. Wilson, the famous ecologist from Harvard, um, talked about, uh, if you read his biophilia hypothesis. He says, we're hardwired, we're hardwired to other species. We can't change that. Uh, that we need those other species, uh, uh, in, uh, th those affiliations with other organisms. Uh, they're in the matrix in which the, the whole human mind originated is permanently rooted. He's, he's an amazing, he's a biologist that is also, uh, like some of our most famous biologists, Iowans like Aldo Leopold, um, uh, are able to look at things biologically and then teach us something philosophically and, and uh, uh, about ourselves. Uh, uh, so he, he says that uh, we really needed wild places and, and Rachel Carson, um, who wrote Silent Spring, um, uh, knew that sort of intuitively. She said that uh, belief of the child is not half so important to know as to feel. If facts are the seeds that later produce knowledge and wisdom, then the emotions and the impressions of the senses are the fertile soils in which the seeds must grow. That's why we do environmental education. It's why places like this exist. It's why we have over, what is it, Emily, now 70, 75 nature centers in the state of Iowa? Every county, uh, there, almost every county has at one or more uh, nature centers. Why is that? I think it's because we're trying to go back. After 9-11, some of the highest usage of both city, state, and federal parks were in the week following 9-11. That's pretty impressive. We were going back, reaching back into that, that connection to nature for some peace 
that we didn't see in our own species. Um, and, and I think it gives us that, and Rachel Carson seemed to understand that. Um, there's uh, a lot of research going on in, in what's called life path research. Um, it looks at childhood participation in wild nature. So we have to start as children, uh, and, and it, it creates this positive relationship then uh, in adults. Um, it'd be interesting, how many of you had a place where you went as a child? It might have been your backyard, it might have been a neighborhood creek, it was for me. Um, uh, it might have been the river, it might have been a woodland. How many of you had a place like that that you went as a child? that you still think about today, <laughs> yeah. I think those places are, are there for most of us. Um, uh, and it's given us that connection, not only to our childhood, but back to nature. It's those, those things that, that we really connect with very closely. My own research indicated that in, uh, with farmers in Iowa, that um, uh, uh, those who, as adults, acted in such a way as to preserve parts of their farms and, and uh, in, in, in wildness and would manage their land in such a way as that it, it allowed other species. All of them had experiences in their childhood uh, that gave them that connection back to nature, that, that biophiliation, if you will, uh, with, uh, with, with wild places and wild things. So why should we care? And I think it's because um, we should care because we need wild places as much as wild places need us. We are, like it or not, right or wrong, uh, agree or disagree, we're the dominant species on the planet at this moment in time. What we do matters. What we do in the tropics matters. It matters not only for the other things that we share this earth with, but it matters for us. Uh, we need those wild places and they need us to help uh, make sure that they continue to exist. Um, perhaps Leopold said it well. I mentioned him a minute ago. He said, I'm glad I shall never be young without wild places to be young in. Of what use are 40 freedoms without a blank spot on the map? And those blank spots are places like this and places that you all have uh, experienced and perhaps created on your own lands. Well, thank you for coming today. So it's been a real pleasure. Thank you.